Our next presenter is uh, uh, Scott Newman. Good morning, and uh, <clears throat> thanks for the opportunity to make this presentation. Um, what I'll be showing you today is uh, some work that's been accomplished by this team of collaborators listed up here. And it's been conducted uh, thus far through a USAID-funded program called EPT, which is Emerging Pandemic Threats. And uh, we have been uh, working on trying to link different data layers with elements of risk modeling and trying to understand disease emergence patterns. Uh, so it'll be a little bit out of the typical ecology areas that uh, many of you are more familiar with. But uh, what we will be covering is looking at uh, some of the other um, agroecological risk factors that play a role in disease dynamics. And obviously wildlife, livestock, and people are all part of that. And uh, more and more, the dynamics between uh, the sectors will continue to propagate disease management issues. Um, just for background, I'm, uh, I'm currently working at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. I uh, used to be based at headquarters in Rome and currently now in the, the Vietnam office. <clears throat> so um, I think that uh, just as an overview, uh, for a lot of the influenza uh, situations that we've been managing and dealing with at a global level, uh, there's been a fair amount of risk factors defined. And, and I think that these are some of the major risk factors you can see in green uh, some of the ecological factors that are directly related to uh, wild bird migration and in particular uh, waterfowl ecology. Um, the second set have to do with different types of farming dynamics and uh, some of them are related to crop production in particular, um, places where waterfowl are seen, uh, ducks and geese primarily focusing in on uh, rice cropping areas but then also other elements related to um, other potential hosts or amplifiers of influenza viruses like pigs, chickens, and duck populations. And so these are part of the farming production systems that lend themselves to interface between wild birds and domestic birds, uh, and then also potentially amplification and spill back over uh, from swine. And then finally, uh, another two elements that really are linked to uh, a, a national capacity, whether it be infrastructure or standards or biosecurity, uh, that, that has to do with uh, the overall financial capacity, the GDP of the countries, and then human population density. <clears throat> and the approach that we've been using uh, really focuses on uh, looking at these spatial risk factors, developing them so that we can analyze uh, with a certain level of definition the role that these risk factors play in the disease dynamics, in this case particularly influenza A events, um, and then plugging them into two types of models, MCDAs and uh, niche models, and then trying to predict where we think the biggest problems will be. And what we've done, uh, because we also have a surveillance program in place for both wildlife and livestock, is we've then gone back and we're trying to verify if our models are actually accurate. And so this is a, a repetitive cycle that will continue to build upon itself. With more data, we can further refine the models and determine if they actually are accurate or not. And uh, we all recognize that the, uh, the, uh, the strength in a model really has to do with the inputs of the data that go into the model. And so uh, we're very interested in that. The last component that hasn't traditionally been used has to do with genetic analyses. And I'll show you a few slides on some of the different influenza clades that we're dealing with. But basically, we're starting to see geospatial distributions of different clades of virus. And uh, the question is, do these different clades uh, present themselves, stay persistent, or amplify or spread based on different agroecological risk factors in the areas where they show up? or are they all behaving in the same way? And so this is the angle of uh, the disease ecology that, that we've been focusing on. So um, the livestock distributions, uh, this is a data layer that uh, FAO has been collecting for many years. And um, it, for, for the purposes of our discussion, I'll stick to just pigs, ducks, and chickens. 
uh, the disaggregation has occurred. So animals are not produced in the same way all the time. Sometimes animals are produced in intensive ways. Other times they're let out and they're sort of less structurally produced in low biosecure systems. This actually lends itself to understanding disease dynamics, whether there's potential for introduction or spillover events. And so um, we've now disaggregated some of the production systems to understand it more, be more precisely. Uh, human population density, rice coverage, and then the waterfowl migration routes and habitat use. Um, and these are just some images to give you a, a feel for uh, where we're at. And uh, what you can see uh, in particular here is that uh, a lot of the influenza A species that we think about uh, are all being concentrated and raised in, in higher densities uh, in the same parts of the world, uh, being Southeast and South Asia. Um, if we take a look at migration routes, and, and this is a bit biased uh, because this is where we've been able to get some of the best data um, that, that has been collected, uh, we've basically been able to put together higher probability uh, zones where animals are moving. And in this case, waterfowl species, maybe 10 or 12 different uh, duck and geese that we all believe are part of the influenza cycle. And so uh, these new layers, you can imagine we're starting to build a series of maps that overlay one another for doing these types of modeling exercises. Um, this, this map uh, shows uh, different types of habitat, and uh, in particular, we're particularly focused in on, on wetland habitat and rice cropping. Um, <clears throat> another uh, risk factor layer, uh, it's not just good enough to know that there's rice cropping, but we want to know is it single crop, double, triple crop, is it only rice, or is it rice and another crop? Uh, a lot of this very much affects sort of the, the foraging ecology of the waterfowl, um, it's important not just for the wild migrants, but it's also very much an important factor for how farmers move their ducks when they're raising ducks in free grazing habitats, which is a very common practice in uh, South and Southeast Asia. And I mentioned extensive versus intensive production. Um, you know, two extremes might be uh, intensive poultry production uh, by big corporate entities as compared to backyard farming where there are 10 or 12 birds in each household, which is uh, actually quite common in, in many parts of the world. And then this, uh, this is just an example of the intensive versus extensive uh, production. And this gives you a feel for uh, where, in, in many ways, it, it's suggestive that in developed countries, there's a lot more uh, intensive production uh, although the developing countries are transitioning from more of extensive production towards intensive in many cases, but still to a large extent in many countries, they haven't really made that move towards intensified production and there's still really a lot of backyard, non-biosecure production systems out there. And this is the same story for swine production. It's just giving you, uh, again, different production methods. Uh, that, that are available as layers. And then population density. So if you think back to where I showed you the uh, high density of pigs, ducks, and chickens, well, guess what? Same places are the high densities for people. So now you start to bring together all the different hosts that might exchange viruses all into one area, and this being particularly South, uh, South and Southeast Asia as, as relatively high-risk areas for us to to try to manage uh, disease dynamics. And these variables have been plugged into um, uh, different niche modeling programs. And what we're trying to do is try to see if across different national borders, if we have similar characteristics that basically allow us to break out high risk areas from medium risk from low risk. And, and the first maps that were generated for niche models um, they, they were not too accurate. They defined really at country level. But now we're getting down to eight kilometer uh, level within country definition because we've improved the map layers that contribute to this. And if you take a look at uh, oh, an overlay of the influenza, and this is HPAI H5N1, you take a look at the overlay, 
what we start to see is that these niches that we've been able to define are actually the same locations where the events are taking place. This is where the outbreaks are happening. There's similar habitats uh, across the world that's been evaluated where these types of events are occurring. And so we think that these niche definitions are fairly accurate and starting to tell us where to look more carefully. In the future, we're targeting one kilometer resolution. And uh, a lot of the data that is derived, um, some of it is satellite imagery. Uh, other data layers are, are actually uh, hand collected information by going literally from province to province or commune to commune at local level and collecting data out of uh, log books. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the other thing that I, I want to mention is that in the future we also want to refine our niches to try to uh, improve understanding virus clades and virus diversity and, and other factors that we think are also driving part of the story. Uh, so I'll get to a little more of those future areas in a moment. The second way that we've done some modeling is to look at, uh, in particular, um, evolution and introduction. So uh, once a virus is introduced into a habitat, what happens and what are the likely places that this would happen? And then obviously the virus is evolving constantly. What are the places that promote higher evolution of the virus? <clears throat> and a fair amount of work has been done to develop these, um, these factors, but we've actually had a group of experts uh, rank what they think the role of each of these different risk factors are to the process of introduction versus amplification, uh, or evolution really, not amplification. And so you can see that from this process with these risk factors we're able to generate maps uh, risk maps for introduction. Similarly for evolution, the difference we see in the evolution map is that um, it's more promoted uh, and, and the, the higher risks are associated with commercial production. And some of the countries like Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Indonesia have dropped out of higher risk uh, when we look at evolution as compared to introduction. And uh, we also see China becomes uh, a higher priority to focus on and, and concentrate on for potential high risk. And you may be familiar with the H7N9 influenza that's killing people in China currently. Uh, we just uh, took our risk maps and then overlaid again uh, the, the geolocations. And you can see sort of the distribution uh, aligning to some extent. We didn't do any statistics on it. We just did a visualization. Uh, and, and you can see that there, there looks to be some validity to these higher risk areas given the, uh, the criteria used and the risk associated. Finally, I'm going to talk very quickly about evolution of viruses. Uh, it's, it's really a little far away from the focus of the meeting, but I think it's worth mentioning that um, evolutionary rate of viruses can be measured now. And uh, you, you basically have a few different ways that you can cue in on it. We've been focusing on nucleotide substitutions that make a virus more risky uh, as it's defined for potential human infection. Uh, so transition of the, the virus uh, at a genetic level has been done and an evaluation using different viruses from these different countries. And what you see is that based on the virus clade, they're evolving at slightly different rates. And <clears throat> this is very preliminary data, so don't, don't uh, take it to heart, really. Just it's, it's a, an area of exploratory work that we think has promise. But what we're seeing is that based on country and clades uh, and over a certain time period, that there are different evolutionary rates that are taking place for the viruses. The question is, what's driving the differences in these evolutionary rates? And can we understand and define the risk factors that are pushing evolution? And, um, this is just a, an example. You can see um, clade 234 in Vietnam is doing different things than 234, for example, in China. Well, what are the differences between China and Vietnam that promote those differences in the evolutionary rate of the viruses? And this is the area that we're, we're trying to go into. Uh, and uh, anyway, I won't uh, continue down here because I want to get to the very end. Future directions. Um, I think that what we want to try to do, as we've discussed as a research group, is think about building in uh, other flyway information, uh, other migration and habitat use uh, data that's out there. 
Uh, you saw our focus in Central, uh, the Central Asian Flyway and the East Asian Australasian Flyway. Uh, we have limited data there, and we also have limited data for uh, African Eurasian Flyway. Um, to a large extent, the program focused on that part of the world because that's where H5N1 high path really was taking its toll and persisting. Uh, and there are endemic countries there. There's less so as you move towards Europe. But uh, there's a big interest in trying to build a broader database to build in these gaps in different flyways. And obviously, people working uh, in, in this program have that kind of data. So that's one area in particular uh, that I'd like to highlight. And then we also want to build in uh, value chain information. And I'll t I have a whole separate talk to focus on value chains. But basically, We've, we've studied bird migration, and we have that data. But poultry is migrating, too. And poultry's not migrating like we think flying, but poultry moves, whether it's domestic ducks moving through rice crops uh, hundreds of kilometers across country borders and back, or poultry's moving from farms to traders onto markets and then onto consumers. And so these types of tracking of these, these different sectors, and in this particular case, Poultry sector is something we're very interested in in trying to think of how to move forward on. And hopefully this will feed our discussion later uh, at the end of the session. Um, there also is a big interest to uh, think about whether weather and climate and some of these other issues are part of the overall story. And, and to date, we haven't really taken that next step. And, and clearly, uh, you know, we heard from Martin's presentation this morning that there's a, a lot of uh, good data that's available. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the whole component that the next session next door is focusing on, <laughs> learning about how to integrate climate and weather data into analyses, uh, this is something that I think we, we have a lot of opportunity to do from a disease ecology standpoint. And we've yet to really broach that and think about what role that information might have actually in being able to potentially predict where disease might move to or where disease is unlikely to occur in light of not just wild bird movements, but also the background poultry densities and poultry production systems and other livestock sector related issues. And then finally, um, I think that our program very much is supporting different governments around the world for implementing policy. Uh, research is great, you know, I think in academic institutions are very focused on research and I think that there's certain uh, specific types of research that feed understanding and knowledge that ultimately should become policy. And so in particular, uh, our program and FAO is very interested in taking science and helping governments put into place policy that protects livestock uh, as well as protects human health and public health. So. With that, I'll uh, stop and take any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead. So I was just curious, because now we've mostly looked at the spatial aspect, we, I guess, very interested to look at how these things change in time as well, mm -hmm. because of the migration in the dynamic thing, and also <coughs> The movement of poultry through the markets is also very dynamic. So, and there probably ha is some sort of a repeatability in those patterns. Right. To see how that dynamicity of migration plus movement around the market <coughs> actually changes the situation so that our policy can become even more focused in time and space. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, you know, time is, is a big factor here, and time continues to change the dynamics. I mean, you know, whether it be migrations changing because of uh, glacial melting and new wetlands developing on the north side of the Himalaya that used to not be there. I mean, that's a big direct change in migration ecology for bar-headed geese. That's a good example. That's happened over, you know, maybe a five to ten year period. At the same time, development, increased numbers of people, urban development, uh, changes in the livestock sector and production. All of these things are very dynamic and, and so I couldn't agree more that it's not a stagnant one-time evaluation. It needs to be a sustainable re-evaluation as time moves forward. And so, um, yeah, good point. There's a question? Yeah. yeah.
sure. I mean, I, we, we have uh, a lot of other uh, outputs of our work uh, that are publications that refer more specifically to your question. Just the short answer is that um, where we see wild birds being involved in, in events tends to be at the end of their spring migration uh, when they're getting to northern latitudes. And that's the wild bird component. The um, poultry sector outbreaks tend to be during the winter season, and they are in the southern latitudes. And uh, granted, the wild birds have moved down south, but uh, we think that uh, to a large extent, the southern events that are poultry related are actually associated with um, the Chinese New Year, uh, Lunar New Year celebration, increase in production and, and movement of animals as well as people during that time of year, and that that's probably a bigger risk factor uh, because if it was just wild birds coming, it would be probably closer to November. Uh, and the peak of those events are actually later towards end of December, actually usually January uh, to coincide with Lunar New Year. That's very different than the southern migration time frame. Yeah. Thanks.